everybody. Uh, we've all had a little bit of a struggle to get here today through the ice and the snow and the lack of power, but we have electricity here, we have warmth and, and love, everything we need is here, and uh, I especially like to welcome the, uh, the people that I haven't seen before. I hope you stay for, for lunch afterwards and so we can all get to know each other. Thank you. Traditionally, the Christmas service sermon is a little bit shorter than normal, and that's no exception today, uh, to allow a little bit more time for the choirs and the skits. And while these songs and skits, etc., have shortened this sermon a little bit, don't be misled. These are theologically rich and full of meaning. And the theme of this year's service is A Baby Changes Everything. And through some of the choirs that we had to sing, the songs and the skits, we've seen in various ways how Christ's coming did change and impact the lives of everybody around him. Even the most fervent of non-believers will agree that the, the man Jesus Christ and his birth dramatically changed history forever. But the theme of today's service and the main question that we want to ask today is has this baby changed your life? Has he changed you? And so with the help of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to look at that concept a little bit closer. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer before we start. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for bringing your sons and daughters, your children, your people, and our friends and our relatives and our families here today to be with us to worship you. We pray, Lord, that we can see, feel, and hear you as our Lord, as our Savior, as Jesus Christ came into this world and became the light of this world, that we can see his light through the lives and through the testimony of all of my brothers and sisters here today. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you'd like to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to start with. How many of you have thought it might be nice to win the lottery? I know some of you are probably very, very tempted to drive over to Buffalo and grab one of those 650 million, uh, what's it called, the mega millions, right? $650 million. That would change your life, right? Well, sadly, statistics show that the winners of the lottery change their lives for the worse. Lotto winners statistically are 20 times more likely to be victims of kidnapping, murders, drug overdoses, 
ironically bankruptcy, kidnapping and suicide. I don't know about you, but that's not the type of change I want in my life. But the offer of the new life, of the new creation, of the, the change that is offered to us through Jesus Christ is not a temporary one. It's not one that has hidden consequences. It's a permanent one. It's one with hope and love and, and, and all the good things that God gives through His Son. But ultimately, the change that is offered to us through faith in Jesus Christ is given to us not as a man-made construct, not something that we give to God, but to something that He gives to us. And in, this comes out in verse 17 when we see this, and, and in the life of the Apostle Paul especially, when we see that before he came to faith, he was on the way to Damascus to, to kill and to, um, to, to put into jail uh, Christians. But along the road, on the way there, he met the Lord Jesus Christ on the way, and it changed his life dramatically. In the same way that some of my brothers and sisters here today, their lives have also been changed dramatically. My life has been changed dramatically since Jesus revealed himself to me. But look at verse 18, and we see in there that this new life is by the power of God alone. And it's not just for the change that is offered, it's also the offer of reconciliation. And this is a, a, a judicial term that has meant that before we came to know Christ, we were sinners and we needed to be punished because we were sinners, but after coming to Christ, that sin was forgiven. I did nothing to deserve this gift. My brothers and sisters here today did nothing to deserve this gift. The Apostle Paul certainly did nothing to deserve this gift. Yes, some of you were very good people before you came to faith. Some of you give generously. Some of you have helped your neighbors as non-believers. Some of you love those around you that were abandoned by society. But our relationship with God is not based on good deeds, thankfully. God doesn't need our good deeds. He wants our heart. Even the best amongst us, the most fervent Christian, the most spiritual people amongst us, still slip up occasionally. But 
We do get selfish sometimes. We, we even lie. We get angry. We, we're judgmental. We're lazy sometimes. Even the worst of us, though, can be good sometimes. And even the best of us cannot be good all of the time. But God, in His magnificence, created the world around us in perfection. And we are held to that standard of perfection. Sadly though, as I just said, none of us are perfect. So we are incapable of having that direct relationship with God. But God, because He loves us, gave us the light of the world. He gave us Jesus Christ so we can be reconciled to Him. The best way to think about this is when, if you imagine two countries who are at war together, within both of those countries, you could easily find good people and bad people. But those people who do the good things only benefit that country that they're in. They do nothing to help the other country because they're enemies. And this is an important concept because it's the same with the kingdom of God. Even, either, sorry, either we are a part of His world under His rule or we are under the rule of the enemy. And whatever we do, good or bad, is to benefit that ruler. Can you see that? There's no middle ground. So in verse 19, if you look there, we'll see this how, how Paul describes how God is able to take us out of the enemy's country, out of the enemy's territory, and into his own. Christ came into the world as a baby, but even as a baby, the world changed dramatically. Many of you here have been mothers. You know the dramatic change that comes over your own life when you when you have your first baby. That's the same with the baby Jesus. He changed his mother's, uh, the, the mother Mary, her life dramatically, and his and his and his earthly father Joseph as well. His family, everybody around him, their lives changed dramatically. His life impacted and changed Israel dramatically. But his death impacted the whole world throughout history. You see, he lived a perfect, sinless life by God's standards, not ours. And this life is not only just a good example to us, it's a 
perfect life in the eyes of God. So you see, he lived in our place as a perfect man. And then he died in our place, taking our sin upon himself. So when we come to faith, God no longer sees us directly. He sees us through the lens of the cross. He sees us through our faith in Jesus Christ, through the blood of Jesus Christ. So he no longer sees our sin, just Christ's perfection. But look at verse 20 as we finish up. We can see that upon coming to faith, we're not just transferred over to his camp, into, the, into God's camp, away from the enemy's camp. We are also his ambassadors. And like any ambassador, it's our job as his people in his camp to represent him to the best of our ability. That doesn't mean we become perfect in, the, in a worldly sense. But it does mean that we realize we are going to be judged for the things we do wrong. And we are duty bound to try and make ourselves better people. So And this is one of the more important ways, especially the apostle Paul tries to emphasize is that how we are changed, how the baby Jesus changes us. We are no longer free to just do whatever makes us feel good. We are no longer free to be able to judge the world around us using worldly methods. Now, we have to try to do everything, everything which came out mostly most importantly in that, in that skit that we just saw, everything we do, we have to do it to the glory of God. Then, and although, yes, we slip up and yes, we do many things wrong, we have to try and strive with ourselves to try and make everything we do a little bit better, a little bit more pleasing to Him. So yes, it's an important concept that we are not saved by doing good works, but we are driven to do good works because we are now in God's camp. We do it because we know it's expected of us. And that's the main point of today's theme, of today's service. That God, Jesus, didn't just change some things. He didn't just give us the offer of salvation. He changed everything. Therefore, 
My brothers and sisters ask you, everybody here today, has Jesus changed you? So recognize your memory. Yeah, so His ministry of reconciliation is offered to you as well. You simply have to accept it. This is one of the reasons why I'm so happy to see new faith faces here today. So you, you may believe that you're here just to be friendly with your, with your family or your friends, but we believe you're here because the Spirit led you to be here today. Because He wants you to hear something. He wants you to see something that may change your life. My prayer is that today, everybody here, everybody in this room here today, is here to be reconciled with your Creator. Are you willing to come to the cross and submit yourself to Christ and know Him as your Lord and Savior? Are you going to be changed by Jesus Christ? Or is it still the mega millions that you think are going to change your life? Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the change that you offer us. A change that is reconciliation. A change that makes us no longer your enemy. A change that just make, not only makes us your, your friend, but your ambassador. I thank you, Lord, that that offer is open to all here today. We simply have to accept it. Lord, I pray for reconciliation for everybody here today. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.